Welcome to chapter five, lipids, fats, phospholipids, and sterols. When you look at this picture, um, I think of cute little pigs, um, but what the book really is talking about in this chapter is fats. And we're going to go over kind of the history of fats and phospholipids, sterols in their diet. Um, if you think back to lard, um, lard is an animal fat. It was until recently the principal fat that Americans used to prepare their food. And the source of that lard was swine. And um, it was an American staple. In the 1800s, um, salt cured pork um, was a, a large part of the American diet and enormous quantities of fats um, generated. Um, uh, we produced lots of things from the byproducts of those. So we um, it created soap and candles and a variety of commodities from the byproducts of fat um, production for food for the American diet. During um, the eight, late 1800s, um, two brothers named Proctor, William Proctor and James Gamble, um, were uh, now looking for some um, cheaper sources um, for uh, pork fat um, byproducts that they were making soap with. Um, so they used some palm oils and coconut oils, which are plant-based oils, but are also what we're going to learn are saturated fats. And um, uh, these high fats caused, um, put together, they made ivory soap. Um, it floats in the water. It's a byproduct of um, initially pork fat and then mixing that with palm and coconut oils um, for a cheaper source. Um, and then, you know, the Procter & Gamble, they were looking for um, additional sources um, of vegetable fats, and they turned their attention to the waste products of textile manufacturing and found cottonseed oil, um, but it was a liquid oil. So we're going to talk a lot about liquid versus solid oils and, and their effects on um, health promotion and disease prevention. Um, so a German chemist in the early 1900s um, developed the process of hydrogenation. And uh, this process ultimately led to products that would virtually replace um, almost all solid types of fats. What it did is hydrogenation um, helped turn liquid fats into solid fats. And um, every tub of lard in the land, um, most people use Crisco um, uh, during the 50s and um, even earlier um, and then going forward um, until the dangers that um, people started recognizing the dangers of hydrogenation. Um, and we started understanding that, but it took us about a century to figure that out. And what we realized that increased consumption of these um, hydrogenated fats or what we now refer to as trans fats, and you're going to understand that in greater depth in this chapter, um, led to increased risks of heart disease and it prompted New York City to, and now the FDA to initiate efforts to remove this. We see now trans fats on labels um, and to uh, force the food industry and people to seek healthier alternatives. Um, so you're going to get a greater understanding of all of this and really be able to interpret it after this chapter. So this chapter is broken down into uh, six parts, fats in our food, types of lipids, absorbing and transporting lipids, lipid functions, lipids in health and disease, and meeting our lipid needs. So this is a great picture, fats in our food. Um, we're going to talk about visible and hidden fats. Um, the amount of fat in our food is not always obvious. The two strips of bacon in this breakfast provide about a total of eight grams of fat, 
but actually in that um, the visible fat we can see the fat in the you know fat strips and frying bacon we can hear it but that muffin there contains uh, about 16 grams of fat so almost double the amount that's in those two pieces of bacon and we call that hidden fat so um, so why are fats important in our food well um, they contribute to the texture, flavor, and aroma of food. It's the fat that gives ice cream its smooth texture and rich taste. Olive oil gives us that unique flavor to salads and a lot of uh, Mediterranean dishes. I think of the Mediterranean diet when I take, think of olive oil. Sesame oil gives egg rolls and other Chinese food their distinctive aroma. Um, but while well, fats in our foods are, uh, contribute to our appeal, their um, uh, appeal of, as far as flavor, aroma, and texture, they also add calories and more than other nutrients. They uh, give you about nine calories per gram compared to four calories per gram um, in carbohydrates and um, proteins. So consuming too much can contribute to weight gain. And the types of fat we eat can also affect our health. And too much of the wrong types, what you're going to learn, and when we talked about lard and trans fats, um, can increase our risk of heart disease and cancer. So it's important to understand the sources of fat in our food, really sources. Um, uh, sometimes they're obvious, uh, like the stripes and the fat and the slice of bacon, um, you know, that we can see um, visible sources of fat uh, uh, that we break it down into animal sources. Meat, cheese, and dairy contain fats. Plant sources, vegetable oils, nuts, avocados, coconut. And then these hidden dietary fats, um, cheese. Um, some people don't realize that there's whole milk cheese and 2% cheese and fat-free cheeses, ice cream, the same thing. Whole milk crackers, some um, crackers have a lot of fat in them. You can see now that Ritz crackers will say uh, reduced fat um, because they've lot, added a lot of, uh, of oils to them, sometimes hydrogenated oils. Donuts, cookies, muffins. Um, so those are some sources of hidden fats in our food. Um, so so how do we view fat from the American diet? So um, our eating patterns have changed over the last uh, four years, even though total fat hasn't changed. And I'll kind of explain that because in the book, I think it's a little bit confusing. But here we see a picture on the left um, in the 1970s, a typical dinner included high fat meat. Here they have fried chicken, um, bread with butter, mashed potatoes with lots of gravy, and it was usually served with a glass of whole milk. Um, today, uh, um, you know, we learned over time, uh, Americans were told too much fat made them fat, increased their risk of heart disease, and maybe even cancer. So what we did is we switched from whole milk to low-fat milk. Um, we chose uh, baked chicken instead of fried chicken, less beef. We consumed fewer eggs, less butter. We, we now know high-fat salad dressing. We order that on the side or use very little. But the picture on the right shows, though we've done that, today um, we eat more fat from takeout foods like Chinese and Mexican foods, fast food pizzas, french fries, hamburgers, and cheeseburgers, more because maybe we're not eating at home and um, we're on the go as much, uh, uh, quite a bit more. So um, our energy, uh, we actually eat more calories now than we did previously um, so our percentage of calories from fat hasn't changed um, our, our percentage of calories from fat has changed it's lower but the total grams of fat is about the same and we're um, eating a lot more saturated fat and trans fats um, uh, today as well so here's a, a graph and what it basically shows is that um, it, it, it reinforces the concept we were just talking about that in the 70s 
Um, we actually ate less calories than we do today. Um, and today we eat more calories. So that it looks like we, our percent of fat is lower, but it's actually the same amount of grams of fat. Um, so we, what we really need to come away with about fats in our food in this section is that high intakes of saturated fat from meat and dairy products and trans fats used in shortening and margarines and processed food are associated with a higher incidence of heart disease and certain types of cancer. But diets um, high in unsaturated fats, those are the healthy fats um, from fish, nuts, and vegetable oils, um, seem to be protective against chronic diseases. So fats are not our enemy. Um, a healthy diet includes the right kinds of fats, uh, along with plenty of whole grains, fruits, and vegetables.